sing hallelujah, hallelujah. My Jesus is life forever. Sing hallelujah, oh, hallelujah. My Jesus is alive. Amen. Well, bless the Lord. Amen. It was good to be here tonight. Uh, uh, it was a good song service. Um, I felt the presence of God even while I was playing the drums. That doesn't come often. Amen. So, hey, could you turn it down a little bit? Um, we're going to continue uh, in our Sound Doctrine series. And so far, all right, let's see. Let's see here. Does anybody remember the first one? No, no, no. The very first one was Jesus. Okay, the second one? It's the scripture. That's what he said. Third one? Salvation. <laughs> Fourth one? Huh? Fourth, fourth one was God. Fifth one was the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I don't know. That's quite, you know, it's a pretty long series. So tonight we're going to talk about something that is actually, will, actually determines how you live your life big time. Um, and so, like, remember, we're talking about sound versus unsound doctrine. So maybe to help you sound so kind of like somebody who's a worry a worry wart right that's like you know what i mean by that worry wart that's un that's like an unsound thing like it's not healthy it's not good to be just worrying about everything right but it's also not good to be oh you know whatever i'm not gonna do nothing just whatever happens you know both are unsound there's a middle ground that it's healthy to be, you know, vi uh, vigilant and want to do good, excel. Um, so both are unsound. So the gospel is sound. The gospel is whole. The gospel is true. Another word for sound is true also. It's true. So whatever, whatever is true, think on that. And so there can be doctrines that are unsound. And one of them, you know, we talked about all of those that I mentioned. For example, on salvation, it's unsound, you know, to be works, works, works. It's unsound to be, you know, everybody gets into heaven, right? So there's a, the gospel is whole. The gospel is true. That's, that's what we bank everything off of, and that's what we preach. So tonight, I'm going to give out some scriptures, and uh, let's see how we do here. And everybody can, everybody could talk here. So don't worry. The floor is open. Um, but I want to give out some scripture um, tonight we're going to be talking about life after death, and um, life after death. So I want to give out some scripture, uh, 2 Corinthians, actually, we're not going to give that out because we're going to do it Alvin Smith style, and it's going to be up there and we'll read it. Um, but I will give out uh, James 4, 13 through 14, James 4, 13 through 14, basically everyone's going to get one here, so Steph, you can get that. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 7 through 8. 1 Peter 4, Daddy could get that. Could somebody get um, 1 Corinthians 15, 53 through 54? 1 Corinthians 15, 53 through 54. Uh, Wendy, you can get that. Thank you. Uh, Ezekiel 18, 29 through Mikael. Ezekiel 18, 29 through 32. Uh, somebody can get Matthew 5, 21 through 22. Matthew 5, Adam. Matthew 5, 21 through 22. Um, Luke 12, 18 through 21. Luke 12, 18 through 21. Marco, thank you. Uh, can somebody get Matthew 13, 37 through 43? Matthew 13, Marilyn, 37 through 43. Um, Matthew 25, 31 through 34. Is that everybody? Uh, Adrian, you can get that. Matthew 25, <laughs> 31 through 34. 
Yeah, Matthew 25, 31 through 34. Liz, you can get Malachi 3, 2. All right. That, that brought us through the intro. Just kidding. So, so we're talking about life after death. Okay. Um, John, James 4, 13 through 14. Life is like a vapor, he says. They're, they're planning. They're making plans. We're going to go here. We're going to make money. And we're going to come back. Uh, we're making all these plans. We're going like, to marry. And he goes, life is like a vapor. It's, it's here today and gone tomorrow. Death is, all, is something we all know is coming, and hardly anybody ever talks about it. <laughs> well, usually death is an avoided subject. You know, we, maybe it's mentioned like prepare for your funeral, but no one talks about, like, literally, we're all going to, I forgot to ask the question, what's universal, but we're all going to die, and really nobody talks about it, and even decay, right, everything's, everything decays, like, nothing really, I mean, it grows, but things decay over time, right, nothing really, nothing really gains life over time, per se, and, and dies over time. And why is that? It's actually a genuine question. I, have a, I had a coworker who, um, who was talking to me one time, and I was kind of surprised because he was like, he was like, really? Scientists don't know everything, why things die. Like, he says everything has a cause. Like, it doesn't just die. Like, there's a cause. So he was, like, kind of grappling with that. I was like, okay, it's, you know, it's a good thought. But in Genesis 3.19, um, you, you can read it later, it, it, but it's, I'll read it. In the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and dust you shall return. So there was no death. There was no, th things didn't die or decay before sin. Paradise, it was a different. It was different. And so that's why there's, there's uh, a, a, um, a, a groaning, well, we'll read it right now, but all of creation groans for what we were meant for, and that's heaven. But we're obsessed with stopping decay, right? Uh, fountain of youth or Botox or uh, whatever you got to do, like the belly fat thing. Uh, people are obsessed with, they don't want to age, you know. Um, go ahead, First Peter 4, 7 through 8. The end is near. The end is near. Not only is death imminent, but what else is imminent? The end. Jesus coming back, right? The rapture is imminent. These are, so the end is near. He's saying the status quo of what you're used to, of life, uh, uh, of going to work to provide for your family, of, of the living, like that's going to end. It, the status quo is not going to continue. He's saying the end is near, and then he gives some instruction on how to live. Pastor Garrett does a great sermon on that. Um, and so realize that the end is near. We're not going to continue forever, okay? And the Bible tells us to live our life with this in mind. And this is a sound thing for you to live your life with this in mind, and it will direct how you live. So let's talk firstly about the reality of life after death. Could we put our text up there, Ashley? Thank you. We're going to read 1 through 5, and I guess um, I'll read it, but... You guys can follow along. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Okay. What does that mean? What, go back, Ashley. So what's it saying here? Our earthly house. What's that? This, our bodies. Okay. So if our body dies, we have a what? A building, a, a body, a something not made with hands, that's eternal, right? So something in us is eternal. Okay, go ahead, Ashley, verse 2. For in this we groan earnestly. What do we groan for? That, that, that body, that building that God created, right? Our body groans for that. 
all of creation groans for that. So earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. Okay. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. Amen. For we who are in this tent grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he, uh, go back one. What's mortality? The end, yeah. It's like, it's, huh? Yeah, I think you said it. The ability to die, yeah. It's like the opposite of eternal, divine, you're mortal, okay? Now he who has prepared us for this very thing, very thing is God, who also has given us the spirit as a guarantee. Okay, so we are eternal beings. Now virtually every religion has, has what we call like an afterlife. This isn't something that's um, new or only for Christianity. It's afterlife it is a pretty universal thought, even amongst not, you know, religion. If you go to, d you know, deep jungles of wherever, there's that thought of an afterlife and, um, and judgment. So something that's helped me recently is thinking of it, we are spirits with a body. Um, we're spirits and we're housed in a tent. And it's kind of helped me because on outreach, it's helped me to think like I'm speaking to a, a spirit, you know. I'm speaking to someone like a, a wounded spirit or something and not just like a, a body. I don't know. It's helped me to have a little more compassion on people when I witness. Like you're speaking. So when you speak, you don't have to like ninja intellectual them because when you speak truth and gospel, it hits their spirit. You know, it hits their heart. And that's what we want. And, um, and that's why the discernment of spirits is, is such a great gri gift, because you're able to speak, you know, right to them, past those things. So, um, and so that's helped me recently. Um, but eternal, eternity, everlasting is kind of the same root word. It's been used like about 200 times in the Bible, even more. Uh, everlasting life, everlasting judgment, everlasting gospel, everlasting purpose, everlasting father, everlasting joy. Oh, so on and so forth. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 53 through 54. Right. So we are eternal, immortal. Okay. They're the reality of life after death. So what we do on this earth does in fact matter. Okay. What we do on this earth does in fact matter. Okay. Um let's let's read our text. Um Ashley, we're gonna go to the end. So verse six. So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home with the body, we are absent from the Lord. So when we're here on earth, we're absent from God, okay? For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with, with the Lord. So basically when you're absent from the body, when you're dead, you know, and your spirit leaves your body and you're saved, you're now present with the Lord. Now that says a lot. And a lot of, you can use that, and we'll see, t for a lot of false views, okay? We are, um, okay, therefore we make it our aim, whether uh, present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Okay, verse 9, Ashley, put it up one more time. Therefore we make it our aim, whether pre pleasant, pre present or unpleasant, Pre, uh, to be or absent to be well pleasing to him. This is why I don't read. You guys read. So we 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 aim to please God because we're gonna stand before him. It says we aim to please God because what you do matters and you will stand before God one day. 
and you're going to give an account on what you did and what you didn't do. Okay? So this time will come. Um, everything you do does indeed matter. Ezekiel 18, 29 through 32. It's in the E's. So they're telling God, your ways are not fair. And he goes, how is it not fair? If you, I'm going to judge you for what you do. So maybe they were complaining about their situation or this or that. He goes, I'm going to judge you according to what you do. That is fair. Okay, Matthew 5, 21 through 22. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there, remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Okay, so Jesus says, Jesus takes it to another level here. You have heard, right, do not murder. But I say, and he brings it to another level, just your thoughts, right? Basically, your thoughts are going to be judged. Your intent is going to be judged. The battle in your mind, you can't just let it rain free, have this dirty attitude towards God, but do the right things. You know, that's, God sees that. Those things are judged. Okay, and this, this is where unhealthy versus healthy doctrine really plays out because we're held accountable for our actions um, no matter what. And this, this, if pleasure on earth is the, if there's no, okay, here, if pleasure on earth is the ultimate goal, you know, there's no life after death, you're not held accountable, then what's to hinder secret sin, you know? What's to hinder... Um, oppressing somebody under you as long as you don't get caught? Or what's to hinder, right? If the Astros never got caught, they would have still been judged in after death. You, you know, you, you, don't, you don't get away. God's not mocked. And, and what's to stop you from uh, doing hard things in secret? Well, you know, what's to stop you from uh, struggling through things or laying down your life for a friend? Only if there's a reward after life does that do those really matter. Um, and God keeps good records. God keeps good records. Luke 12, 18 through 21. Eighteen through twenty one? Yeah. Okay. So he said, I will do this, I will pull down my barns and build greater. <laughs> And there I will store my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, So you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be, soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So he, <clears throat> so is he who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. Amen. So what happens here is we got to decide and we have to realize what is more important, either earthly treasures or heavenly treasures. So when you have this thought in mind that there's an afterlife, that there's more to come, that you will be held accountable, then you kind of have to decide what is more important. What are you going to store your treasure up as? And just like this rich man, I mean, we all understand, but earthly things will pass away, right? That's everything. That's earthly status. 
that's even, you know, friend, relationships, friendships. You're, you're, basically, what do you order your life on? You know, now it's an eternal, it's an eternal goal. And uh, it changes the way you live. You're now more apt to struggle through harder things because you realize we're just pilgrims. We're just, we're, we're passing through. And uh, we're going to something eternal. And uh, you're also more apt to put up with people, <laughs> right? To, to work with hard new converts because that's a heavenly treasure right there. Okay, uh, Matthew 13, 37 through 43. I think that's Marilyn. Um, he answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil, and... The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth, as the son in the kingdom of their father, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire, and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Okay, Adrian, go ahead and read Matthew 25, 31 through 34. When, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats and he will set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left then the king will say to those on his right hand come you blessed of my father inherit the kingdom uh, prepared for you for from the foundation of the world and 41 41 says uh then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay, let's go ahead and read Malachi 3, verse 2. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. Okay. So there indeed comes a time of this separating. What well, is the first one? The first one was the wheat from the tares, right? That was his first, Jesus' explanation, wheat from the tares. And the next one was like sheep from the goat, right? And then the Malachi is, he's like a fire. When you, when you want to find real, you know, real jewel won't burn, but the dross and the fake stuff burns around it. There will be a separating of the wheat from the tares, the sheep from the goat, the the jewel from the the dross the wicked from the righteous there will come this time where there's a, a a dividing and and judgment and this time will come and it's after death and um psalms 90, 94 7 through 15 you can read later but basically it says god is not mocked God is not mocked. Don't say that God doesn't hear or God doesn't see. Um, that's, a re that's kind of a refrain throughout the Old Testament. Um, God is not mocked. He does see and uh, hear, and he knows whose hearts are with him and who are not. And um, everything is taken into account. The struggles you go through, the, uh, the whatever it is, everything's taken into account. Okay, does anyone have any questions or comments right out here? Just talking about the reality of life after death and kind of what that means a little bit. Uh huh. You know, what do you th what do you think happens? You know, after after you die, um, a lot of the times, you know, people can put up fronts like, "Oh, you know, I don't believe anything happens," or. 
I never really think about it, this and that. But in my in my head, I'm just, I, you know, I think like, I think everybody thinks about this. You know, mm -hmm. this is probably one of the biggest things that uh, is like one of the biggest fears for those who are saved. Mm -hmm. They just don't like to admit it. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a thought. Yeah, that was like six foot under. <laughs> yeah, go on. But but you know, you're right. You know, they think about it. And I think actually um, that oh, they, in my humanities class, they, they did a thing on why, peop why people are like scared of what they're scared of, you know, in scared movies. Why do these scary movies actually scare people? And um, I think it's because a lot of them are like, you know, a, a judgment kind of theme. And I think it's because in us, we all have that fear, <laughs> I think. And that's why I think all of humanity, they see these movies and there's a fear. That's why I think. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, please. I have a friendly question. Uh -huh. That says whether you're present or absent. Uh -huh. what, what does that mean? Does yeah, I think, I think it's more of a, he's saying, regardless, you please the Lord. Mm. That's, that's what I came to say. Whether it's present or absent. Yeah. And unless it's more like kind of like the way he's writing, and regardless, you please the Lord, whether present or absent. That's how I read it. In high school, I had this um, art teacher that was like kind of safe, and I remember him talking to like the class. I don't know how we start talking about it, but like about what happens after you die, and he was um, like telling you. Like worse, like what if you can believe that there's not, that nothing happens after you die or that something does, but if you don't believe nothing happens after you die, what if you're wrong? Mm -hmm. Like, he's like, it doesn't make sense. Like you have to believe in something because let's say you believe something and then after you die, nothing happens, then, then it, doesn't well, that, well, it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> but he was like, it doesn't make sense logically because then if something does, like if there is a God after, you know, a life after death, and you didn't believe it, or you didn't follow, you know, believe in anything, then you die, and then you're in trouble, or you're, you know, you have nothing, you know, to look forward to. Mm -hmm. So he was saying, like, even he was trying to explain it, like, just like logically to the kids, like, you know, if you don't even like believing in God, like, it just makes sense to believe in God because, you know, and if afterwards, then he's there, and if he's not there, then you have nothing to lose. Yeah. But if you didn't believe in him and he is there, you have everything to lose. Yeah. So you remember him explaining that to me, like, or to the class, and I was like, wow, like, mm -hmm. he's trying to say it without, like, he, he wasn't trying to preach to us, but he was just saying, uh -huh. like, guys, come on, like, you gotta believe in something. Uh-huh. Well, was he saved? Was he saved? Teaching? Yeah, he was, yeah. like, yeah, he was pretty saved. Wow, that's cool. Hopefully the guy doesn't get kicked out. I, rem I remember, I uh, a class, I was so, I was kind of dumb, but, uh, you know, going back, you would have done things differently, <laughs> but uh, it was a uh, shoot, theory of knowledge class, and um, and I probably should have done more, but I remember I asked, um, oh, because they they, she was kind of like going through things and like saying why everything is relative, kind of, and then I couldn't think of anything else to say, and I was just like, well, well, how about hell? Like, if it's real, it's either real or not real, right? And then she was like, yeah. So I couldn't think of anything else to say. But that was like what I, so it's true. It, it's, it's, um, I don't know why I thought of that. Because <laughs> it's real or not real. I don't know why I said that exactly. But hopefully that was a good story. I um, feel, uh, feel like it spoke to me right now when you said, uh, about how you get like this spiritual, um, uh, when you can go through the battle, mm -hmm. like you're more apt, you have uh, like a, I think like a fortification or, or you see even said like you have compassion for souls and mm -hmm. I feel the same way because like, you know, especially with the LGBTQ, like I feel like you gotta be in a really dark place to be in that kind of, that kind of area, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's where I feel like I'm having compassion for those souls. That, yeah. That's good, cause, cause, cause they're 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 probably a tormented spirit, you know. They're probably, you're right. And then, and if you can see that, you you would push past, you know, some things and realize 
this this soul is like gripped by the devil, you know. That's good. Okay. So there'll be another place to talk, don't worry. So after death, there's a separation into two places. There's basically two final destinations. Okay, and that's heaven and that's hell. And what we're gonna do right now is we're going to go um, give some Bible, uh, some scripture uh, descriptions of hell and some Bible descriptions of heaven. And um, the, these things can be very, these are rich subjects. Like, I encourage you to start with heaven or maybe, because heaven's like rich, man. Like, I've heard some sermons from Pastor um, Eric Stretz recently. And he was like, did a couple of them in a row on heaven. And they're just rich. Like, you can dig into it. Um, so I'm a little embarrassed in going through these because we're just scratching the surface. There's so much more we can talk about. But we're just going to go through and give a description. Um, and we're not going to talk about um, the millennium and stuff like that. Um, maybe we'll do another one and kind of give an order, maybe, of things from, you know, the tribulation to whatever. Um, so uh, this doesn't cover everything, but we're going to go through it, okay? So let's give out some more scriptures. Um, okay, can somebody get for me Second Thessalonians 1.9? Dad, you can get that. Can somebody get for me Matthew twenty two thirteen? Matthew twenty two thirteen. Marco, thank you. Could somebody get Mark nine forty four? Mika, uh, Liz, you can get Liz, you can get Revelations twenty one one four through six. And I'm going to probably be stopping you on that one. I know everybody likes that. And we'll probably end. So something interesting is that the Bible, the Bible says fire and brimstone. Does anybody know the, the, the up-to-date word for brimstone? Sulfur. Sulfur. So Bible, the Bible says fire and brimstone a lot. And so does anybody know one, a couple places where it's fire and brimstone is? Okay, okay, yeah, you're, you're good. That's not what I, I'm what I meant to ask. But you're right, like, like it's in volcanoes or hot springs, stuff like that. But in the Bible, it mentions it like um, one place for sure is Sodom and Gomorrah. Another place... It, right, rain, fire, and brimstone. Another place is uh, hell. And when it talks about it, it says like beneath or under, right? So you might think of that as, okay, it's a metaphor. Heaven is up, hell is down, maybe, whatever. But um, guess what? They've found brimstone, sulfur. Um, it's not just everywhere. They found it at the earth's core. Like the earth is made up of it. And uh, also at Sodom and Gomorrah. Isn't that interesting? That's where they found it. This is scientists finding these things. And, um, and it was just, it just surprised me on how it was, it's written. It wasn't, the Bible's not, doesn't use things flippantly, you know. Like that, that was true. And so, okay, we're going to talk about hell. Uh, the Greek word for hell, um, there's three that translates into hell. It's uh, Hades, Sheol, and Gehenna. The final destination, hell, is Gehenna. Um, the other one, Hades, is I think uh, Hades and Sheol are the same thing. I forget which one is Greek and which one's Hebrew. Sheol's Greek, Hebrew. Um, and so they're the same thing. But Gehenna is the um, final, you know, hell. And the Old Testament, it was the Valley of Hinnom. And that's where, when Israel was backslidden, they would um, sacrifice their children, pass them through the fire to other gods, Molech and Baal and stuff. And um, it's the same place. And so 
In every instance, it's used by Jesus, except once, in solemn warning against the consequences of sin. And it was an actual place in Jerusalem where um, there was, it was a dump, and they would burn all their trash and waste and stuff, and, and the fire was going nonstop. So they had to keep it burning because they're always throwing stuff away. So it was burning 24-7, and it stunk, I'm sure. Um, but hell is not the easiest to talk about, nor is it often talked about today. In fact, it's often left out, but the Bible doesn't shy away from it. So let's read some descriptions. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 9. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So they're separated from God, the presence of God. And also, what does he always say? Depart from me, right? So hell, hell is a place, a description of hell is separation from God. And it's hard for us to grasp, but this is the worst out of everything. Literally, if there was two descriptions, heaven is you're in God's presence, and hell is you're separated from God's presence, that, that would be enough. Everything else kind of stems from that. But it's hard to understand this because we've never felt that. Because God holds life together here. He, he, he's the essence of life. And, and we, we've never felt that complete separation from God. Maybe, maybe we push God away, but God still holds things together. He's still, it's hard for us to understand it. But this is the worst thing of them all. And um, it's the final rejection. You know, people want to separate themselves from God enough. <laughs> it's like, all right, boom. You get what you want. They don't even know what they're asking for. Um, okay, Matthew twenty-two thirteen. 13. Um, then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gashing, gashing of teeth. Nash yeah, gnashing, gnashing of teeth. Okay, so, outer, so another description here is outer darkness. And gnashing of teeth. When do we when do we grind our teeth? Pain, right? Have you ever done it elsewhere? I think some people do it when they're sleeping. Hmm? Angry? Oh, that's true. I do it all the time, actually. <laughs> <laughs> now that you mention it. <laughs> that's why. So outer darkness and gnashing of teeth. Another description. Matthew 18, verse 8. I didn't give that one out. Shoot. All right, I got it right here. Matthew 18, verse 8. If your hand um, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter a into the flame, lame or maimed, rather than having two hands and two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. So another description is it's eternal, unquenchable, everlasting fire. Say what you can say there's no, you can say it's not a real place. Why is it constantly called the lake of fire, everlasting fire, these things? Okay, let's continue. Uh, what did I give you, Mika? 944? All right, go ahead and read it. Mark 944. Where it their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Again, the fire is not quenched, and the worm. The worm doesn't what? Die. All right. The worm doesn't die. Now, I honestly didn't do any extensive research on the worm not dying thing, but when you're in the coffin, you the worm eventually goes away because you there's nothing left for it to feast on, right? So it's like a... It's, it, you want to die, you want to leave, it's not happening. It's eternal. The worm doesn't die. It's a constant. Th that's why it goes along with the it's unquenchable fire because it's, it's, it's together. It's, it's eternal. Okay, that's the description here of hell. We're talking about hell. Okay, this, um, Revelations 14, 10 through 11 says, He himself also uh, shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out, full strength into the cup of indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. Torment forever and ever. So eternal torment. 
Um, Revelations 20, verse 14, again, calls it the lake of fire and the second death. So if you're living in sin, you'll experience the second death. But and that's the sting. That's where the sting of death is. But if you're saved and you go to heaven, you'll experience that. Okay, and if you go, go back in your own time, you could read Luke 16, 19 through 31. We don't have time, but, but these are, this is a, a quick description of hell. And, um, and if, try not to gloss over it like we kind of just did. Like if, you're, if you stop and think about each one, for example, outer darkness. Like um, th- what, what's one of the worst punishments you, you do to somebody? Solitary confinement, right? Right there, you know, you could you could think about that. It's not just outer darkness, you know, a word. It, these things are real, and there's, it, it's scary when you actually think about it. It's eternal. It's forever. So, does anybody have any questions or comments before I mention a couple wrong views? Yeah. Um, it's like a. Uh, you know, an eternal fire, mm-hmm. but yet you have darkness. Mm. You have darkness in there because I mean, fires you know brings out light. Light, yeah. So it's pretty interesting. That's very true. It's very true. It's good. Okay, so a couple of um wrong views is that God wants you to go there. You can read Matthew 25, verse 41. Uh, It was made for the devil and his angels, for the rebellion, and it's God's will that none should perish and have eternal life. And literally, if it was, why has God done everything but force you to go to heaven, even dying for you and taking on your punishment? It's not true. It's a very unhealthy view. You know, you could, uh, one time I, I, um, I had a, a teacher that was so, it was in college, it was Mr. Durkin, and he was so, um, like, easy to pass, like, so easy to pass. <laughs> and um, if you passed, it was like you meant to, f- uh, if you failed, you, like, really <laughs> meant to fail. But uh, it was the humanities class, and he was very kind of, like, made me, it kind of challenged, like, made me mad a lot of times I was in class. <laughs> so in my final essay, <laughs> I, like, um, uh, wrote something. And basically, if you, look at, if you look at God as, like, a horror flick, of course you're going to hate God. That's a very unhealthy view to, to view just unsound to, and not even correct, to view God just like a horror flick, you know, just constantly read this, this judgment. And, and so I was like, you know, Mr. Whatever, if, if, if I just look at all the people you failed, I could think you're a horrible teacher and you're just mean and want to fail people. But it wasn't true. Super easy to pass and, and on and on. So if you look at just that, and that's what people are told. <laughs> so people are told this. So when you're talking to someone, this is their thinking. You know, this is kind of their mindset. We should use this in our skit. And, um, and so it's a wrong view. It's very unhealthy. Um, uh, another wrong view is purgatory. Okay, so purgatory. Um, purgatory is this. Except for certain exceptions, such as sainthood and martyrdom, Roman Catholics believe that they do not pay sufficiently um, the temporal punishment for their sins. Uh, though they're through their acts of penance, okay, um, they still expect to face punishment for sin in purgatory, a special place of cleansing where payment for sin is completed, and believers are remade fit for heaven. Purgatory, however, is not to be confused with being in hell, for it is a. Um, sorry, I didn't copy and paste everything. For it's a short time, and instead it's a paradox, a state of joy and yet of suffering. Catholics believe that those in purgatory cannot help themselves, but that Catholics left back on earth can enable them to obtain heaven more quickly by praying for them and offering mass for them and doing 
forms of good works, which in, includes gaining indulgences. According to the catechism, those seeking indulgences want to shorten their own or someone else's in purgatory. Indulgences is a kind of pardon for sin. So <coughs> did everybody kind of catch that, what purgatory is? So they think they're going to be kind of be made fit for heaven by finishing, working off, and punishment for sin. So that's kind of what you get from a works religion. Is That's kind of got to be there, something like that. Um, so that's a very wrong view. I, I honestly don't even know where they get that exactly. I'm sure they have something. But we're justified by faith in Christ and not our works. It's by his righteousness. And we're going to go to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord, right? Okay, another, th- another false view is that it's not a real place. It's a metaphor. It's a state of mind. <coughs> not if you read Luke 16, where you got the rich ruler, uh, right? The rich young ruler. It's a very real place he was in. It's a lake of fire. The worm never dies. These are, these are real things, okay? Um, and really, for humanism, there's no hell. There's no real justice. There's no, people get away with a lot of things on earth. People who are rich and wealthy, they get away with stuff, or bad stuff. People who are, right, not every evil thing is, you see the exact, the consequence necessarily here on earth. And tell someone who's like that, do you believe in justice? I'm like, yeah, I only want you need that. There, th- there's no justice unless there's, there's a hell. Oh, yeah. Um, Chris. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he had a knife, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's true. And it's, it's consequence. It's kind of like abortion. People are freaking out. Like their world has been turned upside down, forcing you to have a baby. You know, it's a consequence of your a- not a consequence. It's kind of a rough word there, but it is of your action. Mm-hmm. And you just mentioned uh, purgatory. Mm-hmm. If we remember the movie, that's what they were kind of. You know, in the Catholic Church back in that time, that's what they were like really preaching was like purgatory. And you mentioned indulgences, Mm -hmm. and that's what some of the priests were doing. They were selling indulgences. They were literally making money off of those things. So they were also using that, you know, as a form of like, you know, income and and just like kind of cheating people. So obviously that's something I don't know where they get that from either. And then um, a scripture that um, a scripture that came to mind was uh, the I think you mentioned the rich young ruler as Mm -hmm. well. Uh, where he comes up to Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Mm-hmm. So when I read that scripture and I, when I read, when I hear, when I read the word inherit, like I think of something that's not earned, but something that's kind of given, something you inherit because of your, obviously, your, you know, your parents, you have a, they're in a certain position. Mm. So he kind of has a certain understanding of like the kingdom of God, like eternal mm-hmm. life, like it's something that's not earned, but, mm. you know, he says, what should I do to inherit it? Mm. So he kind of, that kind of helps me understand his point of view. Mm-hmm. But obviously we know his response to what Jesus told him is, you know, he couldn't mm. do it. So mm. that's just some That's good. Trying. He had to be born again to inherit. That's good. Yes, you could pass it back, Adrian. That's cool. You want to hold on to it for a minute? Oh, okay, I remember. (laughs) 
So in college, I took a, a literature of the Bible class, which was um, very interesting because we, it was almost like the like a theology class in community college. Um, and I remember when we there was a week where we spent talking about hell and mm -hmm. talking about um, all the language that the Bible uses to describe hell and just kind of making sense of it in a literature standpoint, like the metaphors and stuff. Um, and one thing that I remember is that um, the professor said that if you study some of the words um, in scriptures where they talk about hell and the torment in hell, that you're he somehow was able to relate how the torment of hell is is almost like your sin is a is a means of you being tormented and i think about that because like god ultimately gives us what we want mm -hmm. we either want to be in his presence forever you know the bible says that that the son uh, a slave does not stay in the house of the master forever a son does you know we like adrian was saying we inherit that that um that place, that place in his presence. Um, and so I remember in that class, he, I think the professor was saying that you, you, you get what you want. You either want to be in heaven, you want the, the presence of God, or you want your sin. You're getting what you love the most. And the, but the torment, there will be torment. And, he, and he, made it, made, he made it make sense. Like your sin is gonna torment you. Mm -hmm. And if you think about like people who, you're, they're bound, like you can see the bondage of their sin like on this earth and it is a torment, that's just a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, like addicts, they hate, they can hate themselves, they can hate that's what they're doing, but they mm -hmm. can't stop, mm -hmm. they can't stop that. And there's, and so it's like hell is, that's a little bit, that the way that he described it and the way I think about that is, I don't know if that's true, I can't like think of all the scriptures that he said, but it's your ulti you can ultimately get what you want. You want your sin for all of eternity. You're going to get your sin for all of eternity. Mm. And or you want God for all of eternity. You're going to get God for all of eternity. Mm -hmm. And it's just scary to think of hell being that, like to be that thing that you hate or you, you don't realize that you hate it, but you're going to realize in hell that this is the thing that you hated. It's mm. going to, that's just a one way that I think about hell that makes me really not want to go there like wow. <laughs> ever. Absolutely. That's really good. That's very good. And I think I heard somebody say that they were drilling and down as far as they could go in the earth and they heard like screams and cursing God. And that made me think like, wow, like I thought that that would have changed them. And it kind of along the lines of what you're saying, they would probably still curse God. <laughs> so I, was, I don't know 100 percent, but kind of goes along the lines of that. Very good. Okay. Let's, um, I'm just going to go through this quickly. Um, on heaven, and I have here written, oh man, dot, dot, dot. So I'm supposed to give you a, oh man. But this, this is, it's so embarrassing for me to talk about this part because it's so rich and, and and the more you get into it, the, the the more awesome and exciting it is. Pastor Eric Strutz said it's like trying, you know, when you shed light on something, you're like understanding it. Shed some light on this here. It's us. It's like trying to sh sh use a candle to shed light on the sun. You know, it's like it doesn't work. It's it's otherworldly. It's but some earthly adjectives and descriptions of heaven. Uh, one of them is a home. It's a pl it's a personable. It's um, it's a home. Think of your home. It's nothing like home. You know, you have it. Um, it's also a city, adjective. It's used as a city. Now, that one got me thinking because I've never really thought of heaven as a city. And then I was like, well, there are streets. So it's lively. There's, there's, that, there's stuff going on. It's not this, you're just... You know, it's, there, there's, it's a, there's activity here. And that one kind of made me think a little bit, a, a country, a kingdom. Um, Revelations 21, 2, John's attempt to try to describe what God showed him of heaven, and he said it's like a bride adorned for his groom. Can't get much better than that, amen? It's like a bride adorned. There, there's nothing, 
you don't grimace when you it's when 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 the groom finally sees the bride it's like amazing right perfect you can't get any better right and you don't grimace that, that was the best way he could describe it it was like it was a door and prepared for you marco you should have said amen right there <laughs> <laughs> i saw it's okay i know <laughs> Um, uh, Philippians 3, 20 through 21, new bodies. We get new bodies. Amen. Hashtag six packs are overrated. <laughs> you work all for that. You're going to lose it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding, sort of. Um, I, you never thought of it that way, huh? It's always been the, we're getting, um, we're going to lose our pains and aches. Or you're going to lose your idol, your body, some people. Um, John 14, 2, uh, it's a prepared place for a prepared people. This one has also got me thinking because God knows you. He knows you. He knows mankind. God is the God of joy. You know, joy came from God. Love came from God. Gratification came from God. Uh, pleasure came from God. Uh, all these things... You know, the thing that you enjoy doing here, things that bring you pleasure here, God made that. And, and that's going to be, multi, like, your favorite thing to do, you know. You, you have some time. You just love to go and do that. It's, it's like, way better than that. God, it's a prepared place for a prepared people. God knows you. He prepared it for you, okay. Um, you want to just read through this real quick, Liz? Revelations 21, 1 and 4 through 6. And, and I'll just say it quickly. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. No sea. There's no ocean. Uh, four? What did you say? The, what was yeah, the uh, verse one and then four through six. So the first thing he said was no sea, right? The earth, what covers the earth? Three quarters, three quarters of the earth, right? Not uh, the ocean. So that's not going to be there. Uh, now, I don't know exactly why, but I do know that the ocean is necessary for life here. Okay, go ahead. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There no, will be no tears, no crying. What, makes you, what makes you cry? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I guess there can't be onions in heaven. And, uh, <laughs> what makes you cry? That's going to be taken away. Okay. There will be no more death. No more death. No funerals. You don't have to bury your parents, your children. No fear of death. Okay. Or mourning or crying or pain. Okay. No pain. You don't have to take aspirin. No strokes. The blind are going to see. It's an amazing thought. Imagine. These people are going to be able to run and jump. Colorblind will be healed. <laughs> Go ahead. For the old order of things has passed away. All things new. There's no more curse. The curse is broken. I don't think we understand how, how, how much that point right there specifically is crucial. No more curse. That curse is gone. The, the curse of sin, the thing that brings this, all this is gone. Everything's new. We can't even understand. It's new. It's different. Maybe you'll be able to jump off of a three-story building. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Is there more, Liz, or that's it? Uh, five. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Keep going till six? It's through six, yeah. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give them water without cost from the spring of, uh, from the spring of the water of life. Amen. There's going to be also no devil, no accuser, no corruptible flesh that you have to co constantly battle. That's gone. It's gone. There's a throne. Oh, I didn't know. That is in there. There's a throne. Somebody's on the throne. Not you. John, for, uh, so who will be there? Jesus. Our Lord and Savior is going to be there. The an there's going to be angels there. That's pretty cool. We're going to see. We're going to see those creatures, right? Those, those creatures that are on the throne. Man, 
That's going to be crazy. Okay, God's going to be there. Now, like I said already, this is enough right here. Everything stems from this. This is God's dwelling place. To those who say there's no heaven, well, if there's no heaven, there's no God. Because heaven is God's dwelling place. If there's a God, there has to be a heaven. That's his dwelling place, according to the Bible. And my favorite, there's going to be fellow believers. That's the thing about this. Fellow believers from all over the world. Not just from California. All over the world. And then get this, of all ages. All the way from Adam and Eve to people who are going to be after, well, we'll probably be in the rapture or whatever. But of all eight, of all eight, not one, not I'm 13 years old, but of all ages, like the beginning of time and all over. That's amazing. It's an amazing thought. And not only that, the ones that you fought alongside with. Isn't it going to be amazing we finally get there and we see each other is going to be like, yes. Boom. Made it. And not only that, the ones you fought for. Amen. No, no greater pleasure would be someone coming up to you and say, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'm so glad that you reached out to me. Amen. And um, just a couple incorrect views is it's not a real place, it's a state of mind. You can read Reve- Revelations 21. There's dimensions given of heaven, and, um, and it says there's walls, there's foundations. Real places have walls, real places have dimensions, have foundations, and it's God's dwelling place. I've already mentioned that. Um, you can... Uh, oh, another false view of heaven is you'll become a god and inhabit and populate your own earth. Does anybody know who that is? Uh, a little bit. But Mormons. Mormons believe that. You'll become your own god, inhabit your own planet, and populate your planet with your babies. So where they get that, not from the Bible, it's from their own. Uh, that the man... And I don't even, just real quick, uh, Islam, the man's going to get seven virgins. That's his reward. (laughs) Seventy-two? Wow, two was blurred out. (coughs) Wow. So, apparently that's the woman's gift, too? Uh, Yeah. (laughs) And, uh... All the women didn't say amen. <laughs> so, uh, paradise on earth, not in heaven, and that there's only 144,000 in heaven. That's a false view. You can read Revelation 7, Revelation 14, 18. It's very clear that those are Jews that are saved, and it enlists the tribes. It's very clear there. And... Um, because Jehovah's Witnesses say the only 144,000 are in heaven, and we are here on earth, and it just becomes like a paradise. And, um, but again, that one scripture alone is pretty powerful to be absent from the body, is present with the Lord. Okay. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Quickly. when I used to listen to like other music stuff like that you would listen you would hear you know different rappers talking about heaven but like their own point of view mm-hmm. you know their own point of view of heaven um, which is obviously the wrong <laughs> the wrong uh, way of looking at heaven mm-hmm. um, but it was always things that that I guess like uh, as human you would try to make up your own heaven like some of them would say, like, oh, yeah, I'll be smoking in heaven or I'll be <laughs> drinking in heaven, you know, with this person and that person. Or, you know, there's a there's a ghetto heaven. Uh, you know, <laughs> <kind of thing. laughs> that, that was the type of stuff that, you know, people would say. And 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 then there was another rapper who said something like, you know, only what you just said, uh, only 144 people can, can go to heaven. And then he kind of said something else where between the lines. So why should I even try, you know, kind of uh-huh. thing, which kind of like. In my mind, it aff- not only affects the p- well, it affects a lot of people. You know, the people who listen to these people, uh-huh. and you know, they can come up with their own ideas. And yeah, it's just crazy. Yeah. But 
Yeah, this is definitely a good topic. If you sway from the, Bi the Bible, it gets a little crazy. <laughs> definitely. If everyone had their own heaven. Yeah, <laughs> interesting thought. Okay, let's bow our heads this evening. And thank you, everybody, for being attentive and not going to sleep. But this is the gospel. It is sound. It is whole. Don't make it. Don't make your own gospel leaving out judgment and hell. It's unsound to leave out judgment and hell because the gospel doesn't leave it out. And it's also unsound to harp on it. We're not putting people in heaven and we're not sending people to hell. Um, but our job is to preach the gospel to all the world. Leave the justice, leave the judgment to God. Preach the gospel, not your own, but preach the whole gospel and watch. It'll penetrate hearts and bring conversions and transformation because it's the power of God for salvation. So don't be ashamed of it. Preach it and watch it make have impact. And just an encouragement to the church, it's worth it. It's worth it all. It's worth the struggle sometimes. It's like, why struggle? Why do I have to struggle? Why do I have to struggle in this? It's not fair. Why? And it's, you just get to that point where you're like, ugh, maybe it's not right now, but you know those low points you get, and it's worth it. One time I felt God tell me that. I was one, at one of those points, and I just felt God say, you know what, it's worth it. It's worth it. You're going to see. It's worth it. You're going to see. God keeps good records. Every struggle, every pain, everything you go through, especially for the glory of God. Amen. It's so worth it. And you're going to see in heaven, there's going to be people who do not have these high statuses. They're going to have bigger, bigger crowns than anybody else because, because you go through things people don't see. And God sees that. He keeps good records. And if you stay faithful, amen, you're going to be in this place, amen, that we talked about, heaven. It's going to be amazing, amen. And, and to reach out to people who are on the way to hell, I hope this encouraged you. Let's stand tonight. Uh, and these altars are open, uh, or you can pray at your seat. Uh, but if you remain standing, uh, we're going to sing. Oh, Father.